to meet Jack Donovan and his princely toys. The limelight seeks out in turn each feat of balance. But there is no audience to gasp because there is no fear of failure. The acrobat is no acrobat. He is an automaton. ago the art of making these automata reached its highest point. Never before or since have they been so luxurious or intricate. They have been fittingly described as princely toys. springs. Their lungs, not lungs, but leather bellows. To be an automaton is to exist for the sole purpose of performing a predetermined repertoire. Endless, unchanging, without ambition, but without care. Most of these automata were made in France in the middle years of the last century. They were a miracle of home entertainment three-dimensional movement before even two-dimensional film had been invented. They mirrored their age. The tricks of the acrobats were real tricks that real acrobats performed for the delight of the chic Parisian audiences in the circuses of the Boulevard du Temple and the Champs-Élysées, in the Winter Circus and the Hippodrome. imaginary but portraits of real performers. The dress and the hairdo are fantastical, yes, but fantasy, no. They are faithful reproductions of the get-ups which pulled in the paying public a century ago. of one of the famous Christie minstrels whose heyday was between 1850 and 1870. They sang the old plantation and spiritual songs. You don't have to be a child to imagine him singing them still. 
and you're helped because your first view is of his public face. But start with the workings of an automaton, and the guessing game of what each movement represents is as impossible as trying to identify a man from a journey around his bowels. of the goggle-eyed to feed its insatiably whirring wheels. This set of innards is the digestive process of an end-of-the-pier delight. Almost every automaton has its own jingle-jangle, and the one constant is the source of the music from the cylinders whose programmed pins take turn to strike the tips of the teeth, each a miniature tuning fork. Different lengths of tooth give different notes. The result of all that frantic endeavor, for the price of a bright new old penny, was a tune from the concertina man. with his sophisticated city cousins. He's something of a bumpkin for all his tunefulness. But that matters not. It takes all kinds to make an automated world. He still takes a properly honored place among the population of one man's kingdom. The inspiration of that man's daily daydreams. Because although some of these automata are worth thousands of pounds each, their real value is the pleasure they give their owner, Jack Donovan. As a young man, he traveled the world. Now his world is here. It's a private pleasure, betrayed only in the way his hands invest each automaton with fresh life. Perhaps it's this intensely personal relationship he seems to have with them that makes him exclude excitement from his public voice. I quite like to, to see them without clothes because it's almost like seeing the, the workings of a conjuring trick. It's very interesting to see the trick, but I think it's much more interesting when you know how the trick is affected. The magic, if you wish to be matter-of-fact about it, is in the mechanism. So with the mechanism given such precedence, the cog ceases to be a mere cog. It is much more. Every notch and every bend is the prime mover of some different action. But what action, in which performer, the cog or the lever alone won't tell you. You could guess at anything from a jester to a queen, and you might be right. constituents of levity, the escapements, an excuse for escapism. Within this inner universe, you may concoct what crazy combination you wish. Say, a clown and a pig. The clown and the pig are somewhere in the region of about 20 movements, starting from 10 or 12 levers and branching out through the base, up the back of the chair, through the knee, up the ladder, up the peg to the ears and to the, to the feet and to the hand. Inside the peg would be a framework of metal with levers riveted to the metal, connected by rods to the legs, arm and ears. You could call him poker-faced. 
The makeup of aces from a pack of cards is authentic. 19th century clowns used the grease paint thus to mask their realities. In his attention to their daily needs, Jack does more than keep the automata working. He preserves public memories. The Ace of Clowns immortalizes a mortal long dead. Happily, the real does not forbid existence to the unreal. These individuals were fragments of the imagination. Yet automata always reflected the age into which they were born. When these blackamoors were made, tens of thousands of slaves a year were still being freighted across the Atlantic. But because these particular characters were imaginary, there is still a mystery. Are they servants or are they slaves? Are they performers or trinket sellers? No one is sure. Only they know, and with their makers a hundred years in the grave, it remains their secret. there is also a mystery about their wanderings, about which foreign shores they may have seen between their creation and the day they came into Jack's possession. One I found literally in pieces in a junk shop, the male, but the female came from a house where she'd been looked after. The dress of the female Blackamoor is mostly original, whereas the male figure was a poor little naked boy when I received him. Since then, he's been clothed in the manner of the original. The Blackamoors were lucky that Jack was able to compare them with cousins who had remained extant. Where the line has become extinct through neglect and ignorance, it means hours of guesswork for Jack and needlework for his wife Kay. There are doll collectors who dress their own dolls. Dressing an automaton doll, it's not an easy task because if the dress is too tight, of course the arms doesn't move or it restricts the movements. And if the dress is too loose, then it's in the way of the movement. So it's, um, it's a case of trial and error. Of course, as any follower of fairy tales knows, every princess must have her moments of despair. Otherwise, how could you have a happy ending? This young lady, now with Jack's wife Kay as diligent handmaiden, was no exception. The Persian princess I found in Paris. There were some clothes left with it, but they were in rags. There were sufficient of the clothes that were left to find a pattern, and my wife's replace them with older clothes, the clothes that came from priests' garments have been used to provide the outer clothes for this automaton. So our princess is restored to full regality. An ending happy enough, but for the heat of all those clothes. Like the little fleas that have the lesser fleas, some automata are accorded the privilege of their own automata. A further step, if that's the path you're taking, towards an imagined reality. The 
Persian lady is clearly of blood royal. But in Jack Donovan's world, where clockwork rules, Paris fashioned elegance has to share the shelf with English crudity. At the turn of a key, matters regal give way to matters rural. The farmer and the pig, an English automaton, pretends to be nothing more than a child's toy. It's based on a contest held in village fairs in which a greased pig must be manoeuvred through the opening in a fence. It's a hard job, and during the 100 years that the farmer has been trying to achieve it, the pig's feet have worn a groove in the courtyard. and unpolished technique by which this toy was operated was little more than an extension of the English blacksmith's trade. But across the channel, jewelers and watchmakers were bringing to automata an exquisite precision that was never to be bettered. It seems almost churlish to mention that the bird's trill is produced on the penny whistle principle, with wind from a tiny pair of clockwork operated bellows. Sometimes the birds were given companions, a reminiscence perhaps of the Bois de Boulogne. Today, it's unusual to find a piece like this in any sort of ornithological order. And in any case, the mystique in a collection of automata like Jack Donovan's would be lost if everything were just as you'd expect it to be. Jack claims that he's seen bits of pheasant's tail equipped with thrush's wings, a blackbird's head, and the beak of a budgerigar. are apt to comment on the rare nature of the species portrayed. But then it wasn't designed as an aviary, but as a clock. It is known somewhat unflatteringly as a twittering clock. But the notion of surrounding one piece of clockwork with the camouflage of others was a challenge to the ingenuity of the designers. The foraging poultry are protected against the unseen Reynard by a shotgun. Though precisely what the pecking hens have to do with the wedding is a mystery. Maybe it was a contemporary joke about the hen pecked. Maybe it was a shotgun wedding. By the way, if you're one of those everyday literal people who believe that a timepiece is for telling the time, then forget all the other activity and watch the clock. That's the bit in the top right-hand corner. You can also use this one for telling the time. But now a third ingredient has been added the well-known magic ingredient. It's almost a relief to the hurdy-gurdy battered eardrums that in this case, the only beat is the rhythm of the trick which is one of the oldest in the world. What is unforgivable and may get him drummed out of the magic circle of which he does happen to be a member is that Jack is about to reveal how the trick is done with bits of wood and string and colored paper. The conjurer uses cups and balls, but it was also once done with walnut shells and peas. 
In the 15th century, the Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch depicted just such a conjurer with an audience as gullible then as now. But even the gullible, you may think, will no longer be fooled now that Jack has given the game away. Ah, well, explanations are for the disenchanted. If you so wish, go on believing it's really done by magic. This clock at least is where you'd expect a clock to be. Again, a picture of the times. A hundred years ago, the carpenters and stonemasons came from North Africa to build the churches of France. And it was at about the same time, around 1870, that the clock makers and the doll makers and the model makers joined forces to produce automata of such complexity. It takes a proper dedication to the greater glory of God to stay with a church that's a hundred years in the building and still not complete. world of ceaseless activity, Jack is prepared to join in with the rest of the company. The problem with the monkeys stems from the fact that they have moving faces. Only real skin will repair the ravages of time and junk shop shelves. And Jack uses a very fine chamois leather to restore the lips and the eyelids. too can do a trick. Well, everyone's heard of monkey tricks. The truth is, that is not such a bad joke. The musicians in the great ballrooms of Versailles and Fontainebleau were made to wear monkey masks to distinguish them from the distinguished guests. image, once established by the conventions of the ballroom, was inevitably taken by the makers of automata on grotesque flights of fancy. Rabbits look serious. It's small wonder. The French have always been ones for shooting every moving creature in sight, and the rabbits know it. Since it was the French themselves who decided the huntsman should be a monkey, no further comment is needed. as a chronicler's, perceptive as those of a peeps, observed every facet of daily life. 
Each time the dome is lifted, the dice have been shaken. To the rakes of that salon society, a wager at dice would be as interesting a way of passing a half hour as trying to beat the bookies at Longchamp or Chantilly. There was Montmartre. But the monkey is no Michelangelo. Could that be why, unlike the clowns, the true face of the true artist is not revealed? Oh, there are laws against the defamation of character, mon vieux. Like some weird surrealist creation, the automaton is a model of a model making a model. But at least in the case of Toulouse, there is a sort of reality, in the sense that everyone knows that an artist chatters incessantly to his subject. Just as the artists of the time, Lautrec, Degas and their companions, were finding their inspiration among the bars and the brothels and the circus arenas. So it was not surprising that the automaton makers too should turn to tumblers and jugglers for their dreams. These diversions were not necessarily reserved for the tabletop. They also decorated the walls, animated pictures a century before television. And we still don't have it in 3D. This was for the rich. But there were simpler methods we can still use today. Jugglers can derive their power from sources far more basic than this, and so can acrobats. The techniques for making such simple automata as this have been found in early Egyptian tombs. It could hardly be simpler all done by sand and gravity. The sand falls onto a little cardboard wheel with veins in it, like an egg timer with a wheel beneath it. figures are cardboard cutouts of such simplicity that they might just as well be Adam and Eve or Hansel and Gretel. Here they are Harlequin and Columbine, figures as ritual in French pantomime as Punch and Judy were to British seaside shows. another room of Aladdin Donovan's cave, the most brutal reality returns. The claim that you could work the coal mine for one penny has a terrible irony. One penny might be an exaggeration, but miners sweated for naught but a few shillings a week and that could be lost if targets weren't met. Wall 
12 and 1834. was a covered moral warning. There were clearer morality tales to be unfolded for the populace. Akimbo finds that lack of virtue reaps its own reward behind prison bars. It was as well that entertainment should be tempered with the lessons of human imprudence. We speak, after all, of Victorian times. The search for reality did not, however, preclude romance. Napoleon's hussars might have lost at Waterloo, but they still wore the seductive uniforms most properly fitted for an elopement. The beating may have been unfair. Perhaps the poor chap was only inviting her out for an evening of gaiety parisienne to the gaslit world of show business miracles. Magician's trick that derives from the most famous of all wonders of the music hall, Pepper's Ghost, the walking, talking, transparent terror of the royal circle, and all done with mirrors. Well, here it isn't, because it's done by a mechanism. But you can always pretend it's done with mirrors, or indeed go all the way and know that it's done by magic. If you were to consider what might be the world's most common toy, it would probably be the doll. Yet playthings are precisely what these are not. You don't change their nappies, and you don't cuddle them. If you dropped them on the floor, it would be a minor disaster. The dolls were assembled by well-known French firms specializing in the art. Names like Vichy, Descamps, and Lambert. But the beauty of the faces owes its porcelain charm to the model makers, Steiner, Bru, and Jumeau, many of whose doll faces were portraits from real life. the dolls were the medium for a little gentle advertising. Though the product here, a perfume, certainly seems appropriate enough for its demure champion. Each doll had her own personal tune to which to do her thing, though the actions were never relevant to the music. Friends, the lady magician has one of the Jumeau portrait faces. Her real identity is unknown. But then does it matter? She may have cost as much as a thousand francs at a time when the average wage was 20 francs a year. Again, does that matter now? The important thing is that now you see it, now you don't. As you haven't for over a century. The quickness of the hand deceives the eye at the very moment it most delights. They were 
designed as conversation pieces, standing as silent decoration in the drawing room or salon until the moment the chit-chat subsided. of the maker must be matched a century later by the adroitness and the insight of the restorer. Just to be a clockmaker is not sufficient. He has to be a little bit of a carpenter, an instrument repairer, a knowledge of music where there's a musical movement. It's a skill that not many people have. It's a skill that Jack has had to acquire during the 25 years that he has collected no lived with his automata. To fathom out the mechanism when there are comes, levers missing, is quite a case of trial and error. Sometimes it's possible from an old catalogue to find something that's very similar to the piece that you have. So if you can guess what it's holding, if it's playing an instrument, you work out the movements and you make your comes, rods, wires to suit the movement it should be doing. Jack is still not sure what this automaton should be doing. But of this, he is certain. It is the prize of his collection. The co in all in the crown of his private world. Jack might be persuaded to sell, or swap for better. But the samurai and his attendant geishas, he would never let go. The spent arrows fall to the ground. At random? Maybe. Or then again, maybe it's where the samurai aims them. would dearly love to buy it back, but it's not for sale. This is the one, says Jack, that he'll take with him to his grave. He calls it a burial job. of the samurai, he still needs Jack. Who else will retrieve his arrows and replace them in his quiver? Without Jack, he is soon disarmed. Jack has to be all things to all automata. He is Gepato to their Pinocchio, Svengali to their Trilby, Higgins to their Doolittle. He is their surgeon and their tailor, their cobbler, their dentist and their confidant. He even lights their fags. of what must for them be great frustration. Because although the samurai will occasionally hit his target and the monkey gambler throw three sixes, for the rest it's like that dream where we chase and chase but never quite catch our quarry. 
The masons never quite finish their church. The painter never quite ends his masterpiece. The sculptor never quite completes his creation. The hussar never quite elopes. And the farmer never quite gets his pig through the fence. Oh, the smokers do get to finish their cigarettes. delicious iota of doubt as to what is real and what is not, will understand that there is only one possible way in which we could end this picture of the world of Jack Donovan. Ladies and gentlemen, the Queen.